Tonight, Ukraine declaring a national state of emergency as the U.S. warns a full-scale Russian invasion may be imminent. Russian forces have reached an area just north of Ukraine's capital city as they continue their advance into the country. Tonight, the world is waiting to see just how far Putin's 190,000 troops will go into the country of Ukraine. These troops you can see over here, they are Russian airborne forces. Germany's top diplomat put it in stark terms. <laughs> we woke up in a different world today. As the war in Ukraine continues, we at Calvary San Diego have learned more of what it looks like to be a local church with a global heart. Well, refugees fleeing the violence in Ukraine are coming into the United States. The Ukrainian refugee crisis has taught us our responsibility as Christians to reflect God's global heart of love to the world around us. Part of that is understanding that we can't always fill every need, but what we can do is be open, flexible, and willing to help in every way we can. Through this, God has shown us how he is present and cares for all people in any season of life. This is not the story of heroes helping those in need or those in need showing others how to be heroes. In this season of Crossing Cultures, we share our story about how God brought his love to the forefront of all of our lives in the midst of tragedy. Hi, my name is Phil Metzger, and in 1992, I moved to Moscow, Russia. From there, I lived in the beautiful Central European country of Hungary, where my family and I spent the next 20 years living, learning, and sharing about Jesus. Different foods, culture, and language, but underneath it all, we discovered the most amazing people. We learned that to share the gospel effectively, we had to adjust. We had to cross cultures. Now we're back in the U.S. and we're discovering that this country is a melting pot of culture. This show is committed to helping Christians connect to those who think, believe, and live differently than them. This is Crossing Cultures. As we prepare for this season of Crossing Cultures, we decided to sit down with our staff and talk about our involvement in Russia's war on Ukraine. This conversation will be sprinkled throughout the entire season to paint a picture of our experience with the refugees in Ukraine and in San Diego. All right, you guys. So here we are. Um, we're recording this for our season four, if you can believe it, of Crossing Cultures. Um, when Luis and I were planning this, we were we had been already recording conversations with um, this guy from Wheaton College, Dr. Brian Howell, and they were amazing conversations. And then all of a sudden, our whole lives kind of all changed. So what? I, so we're redoing season four to be this, this amazing opportunity we had. We kind of named the overall like the Ukrainian refugee crisis, which I think is like dramatic to what really happened. <laughs> the, I don't know what we'd call it, the Ukrainian privilege, the, the, the friends we made or something, you know, something like that. But um, what I want to do is just kind of walk through the last couple months of our lives what the Lord did. We've had these conversations already, but dang it, we didn't record them. And so we thought, let's just sit down and do this. And, um, uh, but what I thought would be fun to do is like, you know, the, the, we, me and Frankie and Luis were talking about this yesterday, was like, we all have our jobs here. And then like what we all did during that, <laughs> during that time. Because I think it's hard for people to fathom the, the insanity of what was that month of our life, you know, right? So let's, let's just talk through kind of, um, you know, maybe not even the themes, like maybe we'll let themes come up as we just have conversation about kind of what we've all been a part of. Um, but let's go back to the kind of the beginning of it all. Um, you know, it kind of started like, I think, I think something that we, that people didn't know about or don't know about is that it started for us as a church by, remember we were praying starting in January. For Sasha, right? Was you remember that? that yeah, Sasha. Sasha. Mm. Yeah, Sasha, the chaplain um, with the Ukrainian military, she was sending us videos, right? We started showing them. People yeah. started getting interested. Um, and then... Well, that was powerful just, just to start with that because I remember there was a lot of people, they were kind of uncertain, like, what's going to happen with Russia? They're on the border of Ukraine. And, like, if we can go back to January... They were still like an unknown. People, you know, even our friends in Ukraine were like, "Oh, it's not going to happen. They're not going to. They're not going to take Kiev, or they're not going to go into Ukraine." But things were st starting to like definitely like 
rumble. And so I remember when you had that video of Sasha and she kind of broke down at the end. I mean, that was powerful for our church just to put us in like, oh, the, the, the church is, our church is way bigger than just what's happening here in our local community. We as a church played that video of our friend Sasha on January 30th, 2022. Here's a clip from that service. Uh, last week we, we prayed for kind of just people and the situation that's happening in Ukraine. And of course, it's getting a lot of attention in the news right now, um, rightfully so. Um, I asked a friend of mine uh, who I mentioned to you, she's a chaplain on the front lines there in Ukraine. She sent me over a little video that she wanted me to share with you all and uh, just so that we'd know how we could pray a little better. So let's, let's roll that. Hello, Pastor Phil and uh, Christian brothers and sisters. Uh, my name is Sasha. I'm from Kyiv, Ukraine, from Calvary Chapel. For the uh, last almost seven years, I've been living at the frontline cities and villages, ministering as a chaplain, missionary, and volunteer for our Ukrainian army. I just want to thank you for uh, praying for us, and um, we need lots of prayers because uh, even though the war has been going little by little throughout the seven years um, now of course we have a threat of active combat and active war where thousands of people can perish keep in mind this video was sent to us on january 29 2022 almost one month before the war started in fact the war has been boiling up for several years before this video was taken Phil interviewed our friend Sasha to talk about the events in Ukraine leading up to February 24th, 2022. I think something that we're constantly trying to remind people is that really war began like eight years ago, if I'm not mistaken. Exactly, exactly. And um, so that was, you know, after Maidan and then the annexation of Crimea and then fighting started in the east pretty quite a long time ago and you've been involved in serving as a chaplain there for for how many years now eight <laughs> the whole eight years you've been there yeah yeah you remember that we had a revolution of dignity you know Maidan and so um, it was um, basically a revolution where we wanted to overthrow our corrupted government and um, uh, our church and many other churches, we felt like we need to support people who want to do that because God is never for corruption. He is against corruption. While most of us in the West associate February 24th, 2022 as the beginning of the war between Russia and Ukraine, the truth is war came to Ukraine many years earlier. Protesters confronting security services who respond with live ammunition. On the 20th of February last year, when a massacre of protesters on Kiev's independent square known as Maidan led to the overthrow of Ukraine's government. Fallen bodies on the streets of Kiev. In January 2014, protests turned to rioting when the pro-Russia president of Ukraine tried to move the country economically and politically further from the West and closer to Russia. When the pro-Russian president couldn't get people to stop protesting, he created laws forbidding them. This only fueled the people more to stand up for their rights. They were killed by snipers directly with the metal bullets, with guns. The government turned on people and more than 100 were killed and another 2,500 injured. This morning, ABC News cameras captured brutal scenes. Protesters gunned down by security forces. We are not terrorists, we are free people that, that want to live in a free, in a good country without corruption, with good laws, with good standards of, of living. And so then, uh, when Maidan was successful, we knew right away that Russia will not forgive. Russia will not just let us go. It will attack us. And that's what happened. And so the war started. Basically what they did, they just provided weapons and all kinds of lies and uh, TV lies and uh, propaganda in the uh, eastern part of Ukraine, the Nesk and Lugansk area. And they said that people there, they did not like this revolution and uh, that this revolution was uh, organized by ultra Nazi and uh, things like that. And so uh, they basically tried to uh, start that war inside Ukraine, civil war. 
but uh, everybody knew that it's Russia. Here's Ben Morrison speaking on what the last several years has been like in Ukraine leading up to February 24th, 2022. The war has been going on for eight years. Yeah. Um, so this is certainly a new phase of it, right? Yeah. Um, when they started it back in 2014, you know, Russia kind of, you know, pretended like it was locals, um, you know, that it was all kind of within the country. It wasn't. I mean, it was all, you know, Russia, you know, the Kremlin kind of funding it, pushing it. Um, right. In March 2014, an unknown militia group took over the airport and parliament building in Crimea. They raised the Russian flag, removed the Ukrainian elect officials, and installed a pro-Russian leader. Russia's claim was that they quickly moved troops into Crimea to protect their citizens. On March 6, 2014, the Crimean parliament voted to leave Ukraine and become part of Russia. To this day, Crimea remains in Russian hands illegally, similarly to how Russia is trying to annex part of eastern Ukraine today. Phil and Wayne Cech had a discussion on how this entire war had an effect on Ukrainians as well as the churches in that area. Look back through the prism of, the prism of time, which for us, uh, this has been going on for eight years. So we've been living in this since the mass, um, the mass shooting on uh, February in 2014, the, the Maidan revolution of dignity. And then we put in brackets and against corruption. They never quite finished that bit, but the dignity part was true. And so um, this is an ongoing event. And I actually look back to see how God has miraculously um, forged a people that is now with being able to do what what we're seeing in real time. Um, so that um, so for me, the emotions were in 2014 and after the mass shooting and we evacuated people, I just went back home and looked at YouTube and I cried for weeks. I mean, literally it was. And then, of course, uh, annexation happened and we were in we were in. It was dread. It was like, oh, my goodness, this is, you know, Goliath was slain and, and now we're up against the, the Titanic. I mean, this is totally different. Um, but God miraculously held the country and it was like a house of cards that, the you know, you keep pulling your card out and the whole thing's supposed to collapse and uh, collapse and God miraculously holds the country. And then we saw the amazing Christian response back then. And so the model of what you're seeing the church do now is the same model that we saw as Christians were, where everyone was doing whatever they could uh, and wherever they found themselves to be. And then the Christians went forward to the places where literally were hemorrhaging and planted churches. And we saw a chaplaincy movement um, that is now. So you go from communism to now within the military and the police force, there are, there are the spiritual born again chaplains that are there seen as a very as a vital role of, of what's going on. This is where people like our friend Sasha have played a role in serving soldiers in Ukraine for many years before February 24th, 2022. Chaplain's ministry was very new for us. We knew some friends who were chaplains, but very, very few. Mm. And I did not want to go to the front line first because I thought I'll meet friends, I'll see soldiers who will become friends and then they'll die because people were already dying. And um, so I thought I'll have, you know, all kinds of high blood pressure issues and heart issues and and um, things I'm having now. <laughs> yeah. And so um, I prayed and I, I, I didn't know what to do, how to do. I didn't have a uniform. and. Um, uh, I was invited in uh, 2015 to go to Stanitsa Luhanska, which is like four miles from the front line. And uh, eight of us, we went and we started a Christian volunteer center there. <clears throat> um, it was after Stanitsa Luhanska was freed from being occupied, because it was occupied in uh, 2015. And so after a couple of months, um, I decided that I cannot go back and forth. I have to move. I have to move to stay in Luhansk and live there constantly and help and minister. And so um, my pastors, they laid hands on me. They said, okay, we now ordain you as a deaconess. You go, you minister, you do whatever God has called you to do. You're our missionary and things like that. And um, so it was hard 
much shelling, much fighting, um, lost uh, one friend there uh, during fighting, and um, God was opening the door to minister to soldiers. And, and so, you know, before the war, again, before 2014, um, a lot of people looked at, you know, Protestant Christians as kind of like, well, you guys are kind of a sect, right? Like, right. you're, you know, you're, you're sort of a cult. Um, right. You know, we're not, we're not quite sure who you are and, yeah. and why you're not part of like the Eastern Orthodox Church. Um, you know, but as time went on, um, you know, there was no chaplaincy, for example, in Ukraine, and the vast majority of people who became chaplains to serve the soldiers were, you know, Protestant pastors and ministers. Nice. Um, you know, the people who were doing a lot of the housing of that, again, this is back in 2014, the first wave of refugees that came just out of the, uh, you know, the small section in the East that, that has been controlled for eight years. Um, I mean, it wasn't small, it was like two million people. Um, which is a lot, but it's a lot less than right now. Um, you know, now we're up to like 12 million refugees and internally displaced. Um, so, uh, yeah, but a lot, you know, a lot of the churches, Protestant churches, you know, were, were the ones kind of ministering to these people. And all of a sudden you would find like people's attitude in general and the mm. culture shifted to where it's not like, oh, you guys are that weird cult. It was like, oh, you're, you guys are the ones who help people. As you've already heard, since 2014, the local church has been ministering to the Ukrainian people as they fight for their country. This brings us back to the video of our friend Sasha. It was sent to us one month before Russia invaded Ukraine again on February 24th, 2022. Here is the rest of the video we received from Sasha. So please pray for us, pray for God's mercy. Uh, pray for me as I share God's word. Our army is ready to fight for for sure. They're ready. They they're brave. They know God is with them. They know they protect their land that was given to them by God. And um, uh, I don't have a plan. I don't know what will happen. I pray at night and I go to bed and I'm happy to wake up in the morning. Sometimes we hear some shooting and some explosion and things like that. My friends, my soldiers are telling me that sometimes here and there snipers are working. So please pray because um, we need to fight. We need to be strong. We really need to um, represent God and I need lots of wisdom and support. So we want to praise the Lord. I, with my soldiers, I want to praise the Lord. I want to thank him forever. And so he's worthy of praise. And um, it's just nice to know that such powerful God is with us. It is really nice. So may God bless you and um, God bless America and God bless Ukraine and God bless all the good people. We love you guys and um, thank you again for being a um, church who cares and who prays and will fight and um, God already has victory. So amen. <laughs> And I remember like people were, they were praying for Sasha. You were giving updates. She was giving us updates. So you're right. That's kind of where that's, that's what started our churches. Um, like the, just the, the vision to be praying towards Ukraine was with Sasha. We had a conversation with our friend, Paul Billings about his experience in Ukraine, as well as his perspective on the war leading up to February 24th. Paul talk through that, like that, just that season, like right when things started happening, what was going on in you, you and Mel, your heart, your mind? Yeah. So like to give context for people then watching or listening, it's like, this is not like a short-term mission trip kind of a thing. Melanie was literally yeah. raised there. And in many ways, you know, I've been with you a long time. So were you as, a, as an adult. This was home. Yeah, sure. Definitely Ukraine has and always will have a huge part of our hearts. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, so when we... You know, it's crazy because leading, like leading up to the war, right? I mean, everybody would probably remember the news and all the warnings and Russia building up their military. And, um, I think what I was expecting was something like uh, what had been happening since 2014, right? Where they just kind of take a small piece of land, you know, and kind of say, well, there was Russian speakers there, you know, so this was kind of us you know, liberating, but nobody, I don't think anybody really thought that they would uh, invade all the way to the capital. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, 
so that was it was very shocking you know and obviously uh having uh you know melanie's three of her brothers live there with their with their families uh, a lot of small kids and as things got closer we could kind of sense that something was bigger than than we were anticipating so we were talking about with one of melanie's brothers about sending his family out he was living in Kiev, you know that's where they live that's their home uh and uh so thankfully they did do that they were able to do that but you know he 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 stayed uh, until after the invasion and they started you know bombing Kiev, and he had a pretty hard time getting out it felt like each week it started to get a little bit more serious right like oh dang like this is getting real and then and then um so then february 24 the war started Overnight, in the capital of Ukraine, the sound of missile strikes and air sirens. Authorities, meanwhile, have told residents there in Obolon to stay off the streets as they say active hostilities are approaching. Explosions rocking several cities, including the capital of Kiev. On Thursday, the full force of the Russian military was released. From the air came planes, helicopters and missile strikes. A full-scale invasion of Ukraine, the largest invasion of a neighboring country in Europe since World War II. It's scary, you know, like there is a a terror that grips you um, that is, um, it's hard to explain, you know, it's not like, um, obviously people respond differently, but when you have your wife, you know, and your young children with you, it's really scary. You know? mm. And so I was talking to one of Melanie's brothers on the phone as they're driving, mm. they're trying to drive out of Ukraine. And this is early on when all the borders are backed up for kilometers and kilometers and people aren't able to get out, you know, and they're, you know, they have, I don't even know how many people they had their, you know, eight passenger van, probably 20 people packed in there, you know, and they're driving for, I think, I don't even know, but they, they were easily 24 hours yeah. in the car, you know, longer than that. Uh, but I was just talking, I was like, hey, like, how are you doing? What's going on? He said, well, we're trying to get to Hungary. You know, we, we know a place that we could at least stay there. And I said, well, you know, we're, we're thinking about meeting you guys there, you know? And he said, you know, that would be, that would, that would be really, really nice, you know? And uh, so, yeah, we just went kind of with the initial part of receiving like our, our family and then even some of our friends, our Ukrainian friends that were coming out as well. Uh, and just because, I mean, how do you process that, right? You're like in your home and literally, you know, in less than a day, you're out of your home. You've had to leave everything. You don't know if you'll ever see your home again. You know, you're talking to your friends who are further east and their homes are already being destroyed. You know, it's just, it's, it's things that most of us will never have to process, you know, very difficult things to, 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 to process. So we wanted to be there with them, you know. I think that was a, uh, that was one of the things that really struck a lot of our people here in San Diego is they were befriending and housing Ukrainians coming across into the States. You know, you start talking to people and you realize they have, you know, I think when we think of like refugee as a it, traditionally, you you always associate that with you know um, they already didn't have a good life. Whether we whether we think that way or not, consciously, subconsciously, we do. Especially here in California, where most people coming up are trying to leave cartel wars or you know third world environments that are really already terrible and so you kind of become i think a lot of san diegans become in california become kind of numb to the idea of migration sure. and then you sure. you start talking to ukrainians who oh i owned my business we had a wonderful life we enjoyed our our family we enjoyed our lives and then it was just gone and that that is such a disassociating concept that you, like you just said paul i don't think we can really grasp it in its fullness like to lose everything or the fear of losing everything and as you said it wasn't a chipping away things moved very quick across a lot of the country and you know yeah they didn't take it over russia didn't win those things but the fear was almost immediate our missionary friend ben morrison who you heard earlier had his own unique first-hand experience with the war 
Phil sat down with him to talk about his church's perspective in Ukraine. You know, all, all people that are probably US citizens here, you know, we're getting emails from the embassy beginning back in, you know, early January saying, you know, this could happen, you should consider getting out. And then kind of the closer we got it was, you know, we really strongly urge you to leave. Um, you know, but I mean, obviously our, our ultimate king is Jesus, um, not, not any consulate. So, you know, we prayed about um, you know, what it is that God would have us to do and um, you know just really really we're convicted that you know we need to stay and I mean if we if we take off like who's going to serve all these people here um, you know and and there is a number of factors as well I mean we're in you know we are further east than Kiev uh, but we're on the west bank of the Dnieper River that divides the country in half uh, we're kind of central Ukraine so we're not you know super near to any of the front lines of fighting um, during the first weeks when they were coming in towards Kiev in the north, we were sort of, you know, we were sort of surrounded like on three sides, mm -hmm. um, you know, so um, after after they pushed the Russian forces out of the north, um, then it's just the east and the south that, that there's, you know, a lot of activity on right now. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, really the first day we already had, um, I think, like a dozen refugees coming. I mean, it was it was chaos wow. those first, you know, first few days. Um, I was woken up, we had sent out my previous assistant pastor to plant a church um, in a city further east. Uh, on February 24th, I got woken up by a phone call from him, um, you know, saying they're bombing the city, we're coming back, you know, to oh you goodness. guys. Um, so that was that was how my morning started on, on February 24th, um, you know, and it was just, it was just, you know, scrambling and adrenaline and people were just flooding out. I mean, um, you know, and when very quickly we realized we were going to, you know, be serving a whole lot of refugees. Um, so, yeah, the dynamic has changed. I mean, now in month four, um, you know, the very beginning, it was people, it was all the people who, you know, they had their own cars, um, you know, mostly young uh, families. They were, you know, they were kind of quick to get up and leave. Uh, and most of them only stayed in, I mean, we, Thankfully, in God's providence, we actually had been working on uh, procuring our own church building, kind of mm. building it um, for the last five or six years. And we only just got it ready last year. Oh. Um, so it's ready kind of just in time. Right. Um, and we've, right. you know, we've been able at this point, we've housed over 300 refugees in the church building. Um, those first days, it was just like, you know, most people came for a night and then they just headed on as fast right. as they could. Um, so as time has gone on, they've, uh, you know, stayed for longer. Um, and now more and more, uh, you know, we're, we're actually the ones doing the evacuations now because a lot of the people that are still left in the very dangerous areas, part of the reasons, cause they don't have their own transport probably. Um, so we're actually, you know, we've, we've been able to acquire a couple, couple vans, uh, to mm -hmm. go in and get people out. Um, so just a couple of days ago, we did this seventh run that we've done um to pull you know people out of areas that are i mean very directly you know being shelled like our drivers right. were like you know it was loud um so yeah um yeah and i mean um hmm. in the midst of i mean it's you know it's 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 awful it's evil um you know we're praying all of the psalms especially the imprecatory hmm. psalms um you know, uh, for for God just to to smash these these evil intentions of you know Putin and his his whole whole circle of people there, um, you know, and and those who are just trying to cause destruction um, against you know a country that was not not provoking them in any way. Uh, this time around, as things were beginning to heat up, I mean, we have we have Russian pressure every year. This is Wayne Check again talking about his perspective in Ukraine within the past eight years. For most Ukrainians, the the situation was, you know, they're going to stand down because that's what they always do. They're just hanging over the fence, you know, just th uh, threatening. And they, ha they end up backing down after getting some sort of political concessions or, or whatever. But um, through OM, we were getting the intelligence reports and uh, pre preparing contingency plans if and, and, you know, where will you be if this happens? Mm. Oh, here we go again. So um, actually, the guys uh, that were leading us through that pretty well prepared us in weeks in advance. And then I went, I went to sleep 
the night before it happened thinking this may be the last full night's sleep that I get. And I was able to get a full night's sleep and we woke up to explosions in the, in, in the morning. So then it's, then it's not, it's okay. It's not the word dread, but it's like, right. This is what we were preparing for. Mm-hmm. We've been here before. Like even now I get the goosebumps mm-hmm. remembering that, that, that moment, but we clicked in and we were prepared because I had fuel saved up. Um, and we had cash reserves and, uh, we, yeah, we moved to that step. So we were more prepared than a lot of the Ukrainians who have, you know, been lulled into a, we, we live with war going on. And so sort of like the denial in a way, but, um, I mean, I got my church leaders together a couple times and said, guys, well, what, you know, are we going to do something? Are we going to do something? And it's like, oh, attacking Kiev is ludicrous. I mean, that's insane. You just can't take a, a city of, 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 you know, three million people, and that's that's the whole thing. Was um, what happened on the scale is, is is pretty much the most extreme that you can get without taking non-conventional warfare. So, um, and every single an analyst was saying they don't have enough troops. They don't have enough troops. They don't have enough troops, and they've had to abandon the, the whole northern area. So they've made they've made so many big mistakes that um, only so I you have three categories. You have one the Russian the, the what the Russians did and their um, the mistakes that they made and their mindset believing their own propaganda. I mean they thought all of the revolutions were paid for by the CIA. So when you when you think that oh it means if they're paid for we just need to put pressure on and apparently um, that's been proven proven differently now so you've got the Russian mistakes then you've got the Ukrainian response if this happened in 2014 Ukraine would have fallen like it's absolutely but but God has prepared that's the third thing is God has been miraculously in this mix and I use the analogy of uh, the only time in the New Testament where yeast is used in a positive way, you know, uh, the the kingdom of God is like this, where the, you know, the 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 yeast in the in the dough, and then what do you get? It goes through the whole dough, and we see an amazing different product. And the Christians, like in 2014, building upon that, have been integrate, totally mixed into this this equation. And it's been a beautiful thing to, to, to see. Just as Wayne mentioned, God is at work in every place in our lives, even in the midst of tragedy. And the local church has a huge role to play in that. Paul Billings and Ben Morrison continued this thought in their conversation with Phil. Uh, you know, when you think about, you know, just migrants or people, or refugees coming, you know, like we don't necessarily have the answers to these problems, right? I mean, these issues are huge they're way beyond us but yeah as the church i don't know that we are maybe directly called to you know solve those kinds of problems but we are called to be with those people amen oh you know and and so i think that's where you know we have to be there you yeah. know and uh, so that's been, that was cool to see san diego you guys and many people there in the states respond the way and churches man all over europe i mean i was shocked i i really i was genuinely shocked at the um, just how quickly churches were willing to help and do anything they could, uh, how drenched they, they were with finances, but also getting involved themselves. Um, the yeah. Church. I mean, well, the generosity of and the uh, the immediate like investment of everybody's, you know, not money investment only, but just like life. Like we're in, we're yeah. we're helping. It was, it was like kind of like a. There was all this like fear that was happening on one hand for us and but then on the other hand it was like I've never seen this kind of outpouring Um, let me ask you about that Ben if you don't mind I want to ask you about like what have you seen you know been there month four in terms of like just like gospel outreach and you know because and I was just talking with others about this you know I think for so long you know people that are outside of the church and outside of the Christian faith, they look at the church kind of with suspicious eyes. Like, what is it? What is the church? And it's a broad ranging perspective. Some are like, oh, it's cute. Let them have whatever they do. It doesn't matter. To kind of outright, like a resistance to the idea of the church because, you know, um, 
Like, what are they? What value do they bring? And I think at least in Ukraine, I could say, um, and I'd really love your your thoughts into this. I think that most of Ukraine is acknowledging the, the great value of the church. I'm saying the big C church. What have you seen these last four months from that perspective? This idea of like the work of the gospel, not just to preach a Sunday morning sermon, but like really the work of the gospel in the country these last four months. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, obviously when when we're, we're we're trying to share both practical help, obviously, you know, they're coming, they need a place to stay, they need to be fed, you know, we're feeding, at this point, we're feeding not only the refugees that are staying in our building, but uh, over 500 refugees in the city every week, um, you know, are coming and getting food. Uh, but also, you know, to, to bring them hope, um, because that that's something that, you know, is really lacking, um, you know, when you have to abandon your home, when you've had, you know, we had one old couple that came and their car literally was like shot through with bullet holes. Um, you know, their, their windows of their car had been blown out by rocket explosions. Um, you know, I mean, that's to different degrees, but, you know, some of these people are coming very traumatized, um, you know, so, you know, we just try to, to, you know, let them know they're in a safe place. We don't try, we don't try to like jump on them and, and evangelize them or anything, uh, um, you know, but they, they end up asking questions like, you know, well, why, you know, why are you doing this? Why are you here? And, you know, how are you, how are you, because they see that, you know, we're still hopeful. Uh, so, you know, how, how are you keeping this, this hopeful mindset? You know, we had one guy who he was actually, you know, he, he was, um, so the default kind of, uh, religion here is Eastern Orthodox Christianity. He was asking, he's like, so, so explain to me, why are you so joyful? Uh, <laughs> like that was his question. Love it. Um, he's like, he's like, you know, cause I'm used to going to church and people are, you know, kind of very serious yeah. and kind of downcast and, um, you know, and so we just kind of started talking about the gospel, like, because it's actually really good news because, you know, Jesus has already done everything. It's not up to you to earn it. Um, you know, and at one point he turns to his wife and he goes, he goes, now I understand. He's like, it's because it's all finished. I'm like, exactly. <laughs> um, mm. And that guy, that guy, they, 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 that was a couple that ended up staying in our city. He's now, uh, he, uh, a week or two later, he actually, he, you know, he hangs out a lot, helps serve other refugees, ended up praying to receive Christ. He's now a member of our church. No way. Wow. Yeah. That's... Oh, I just love it. And, and 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 we're hearing this all over the country, truly, like in, in, in the hardest, in the easier, in the softer, the, whatever it might be, we're hearing, you know, and again, it's that like idea that God brings beauty out of ashes. And we don't want to, you know, in no way am I minimizing like the pain of what people are going through. But I just think it's important that people also see that like, uh, this is where, you know, and I was just, I was talking with Paul Billings not that long ago about this idea that the, the local church is an amazing, beautiful, dynamic entity that God has created globally. You know, like I always told people here, the church is the largest aid agency, if you want to see it that way, in the world, because we're, yeah. we're everywhere. We're able to jump in right away. We titled this episode, Without Hesitation, because we saw how the church responded to the overwhelming need in Ukraine when things went from bad to worse. This looked like local churches around the world playing their part in helping Ukrainians in their time of need. The needs in Ukraine were immediate, much like Paul the Apostle describes in Titus 3.14, when he says, our people must learn to do good by meeting the urgent needs of others. Then they will not be unproductive. Through the church's response to the urgent needs in Ukraine, we saw God do a work. He brought hope to Europe despite the heartbreak of war and evil intentions of world leaders. It felt like it caught everybody off guard. Like, yeah. this is actually happening. You know, obviously, like, that's when our whole, like, experience of, like, just decisions being made immediate. <laughs> no more, like, you know, let's wait till our Monday staff meeting to talk things through <laughs> and have a conversation. It's just kind of like, it just has to happen. I think it was that same week we were like, well, I think it was like the day of the war starting. Like, okay, what should we do? Because we were planning on going somewhere. It was like, I don't know if we were planning on going somewhere or like we were thinking of the spring break, like to take Hannah somewhere or something such like that. It's such a blur, it's such a blur, the timing. Because I remember thinking, you're going to go, you're going. And we had a prayer meeting 
on Friday and I was like, yeah, Phil's probably going to be going out tomorrow. I didn't, I didn't know that we were all going. Yeah, and we left like the ne- two days later. We got a ticket the next day, yeah. Yeah, we bought, so it was all like boom, 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 yeah. boom. And then we spent that time and we're going to have those conversations with other people, but we spent that week there. And I think that did something for our church. That feeling of like, we're involved, huh? The fact that you were going and then that you were there and... I remember having this shift like, oh, no, we're directly connected to yeah, what's sure. going on. It and became very the personal. The prayers were, not that we, I wasn't like moved to pray for Sasha, but like, I do life with you and you yes. and Hannah and you guys are yes. there. So it's like, oh, my God, like I'm just really praying for everything that's going on in a different way. Wow. Yeah, it became real. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Well, the other thing, too, that was really, uh, our church got very involved because we raised a lot of money in in about two days. Mm-hmm. Remember that whole thing? Oh my god! That, that, yeah. that was like, yeah. was yeah. like how are we forgetting this? We yeah. couldn't go to the Thank bank. You. Remember, we couldn't go to the bank because we didn't have enough time. No, and no. we just asked yeah. people to give us cash, yeah. and that we were going to <laughs> how much, reimburse how, how much them. Cash, how much cash did you have in your carry on? You Thirty five thousand dollars, I believe. Just in his carry on. So like on literally airplane. in one day. We raised $35,000. Yeah, because I think we sent it out the night before, right? Phil sent the text to various people in our congregation on Saturday, February 26th, which read, Hey friends, this is a bizarre text, but I need cash today. This text is actually not a scam or a joke. Ha ha, not a fake text. I need to get as much cash as I can to take to Hungary and Ukraine. We won't be able to get enough out of the bank in time, but the church can write you a check for any amount if you bring it to church today. End of text. This was such an odd text to receive, but even still, our congregation quickly responded and put together over $30,000 overnight. In fact, the money was coming in so fast that by 2 p.m. that Sunday, our financial manager, Ben Ortiz, asked people to stop giving. We had reached the monetary limit that was allowed on the flight. Yeah, you did send it out. If you have cash, to, we're going to meet tomorrow morning, bring some in, and we'll see what we can come up with. And yeah, it was like almost $30,000. Yeah, it was like something like that. It's funny how simultaneously something like so crazy with money, and even if we tried to strategize or try to make this, which obviously we could never, but it was like the most natural thing for us, for me, I can, I, and for Hannah, it was like, we're going home. We're going to We're going back to what we know. But it was like the moment of like, I feel like a pivot point as our whole team and our whole church became like, it became personal. Like our lives came together. Mm-hmm. But we didn't try to do that. You know, we didn't like want Like two war. worlds became one yeah. world. Yeah. We didn't want war to make that happen. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously yeah. not. And then the generosity and oh the lack. Gosh. There was no hesitation generosity. from yes. the church to like, what do you need? Here we go. Yes. And then that moment and just that Sunday yeah. in those few hours to have the church just come on board. It's like, this is happening. This is real. Our pastor's going. We're directly, like you said, Kia, directly connected. We felt such trust. Like we felt like the congregation trusted and oh, we're yeah. in, you know, not just personal trust, but yeah. there was that like generosity. That was so humbling, I think, to feel like pe- people are in this. They trust us. They mm-hmm. believe like their their hearts are torn. Don't you this. think that like that, that those are the words that I would use for the whole experience we just had without hesitation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It became like the was... the motto of everything. Like it's like should we do this? Yep, let's just go do it. Yeah. <laughs> just yeah, let's like go. They were all in. It seemed like whatever we said, hey, we're gonna do this. They're like, okay, yep. and then like incredible. an overflow of like, yes. okay, we're all in. We're just gonna do it. And it really started going back with Sasha and praying for Ukraine. Yeah. And then when this thing happened, they were just. I mean, we raised that amount of money That's in like exactly. literally a day, and then yeah. you guys were off. Yeah, and then we were gone. I cannot guess at the full meaning. I just simply succumbed to the first dim beginnings of understanding a radiant love. Once something without, now I've got someone within. Your voice was soft with relentless whispers. 
have been listening to Crossing Cultures. The song you just heard was Shake the World by Josh White. You can find his music on any music platform. As we are creating these episodes, the war in Ukraine is still going on. As a church, we are currently involved in financing and aiding our missionary friends and families in Ukraine and Europe. The aid is used to help people get out of Ukraine safely and get needed supplies into the country. If you would like to help donate to this cause, please go to calvarysd.com forward slash Ukraine Relief. You can find this link in the description of this episode. And stay tuned for our next episode of Crossing Cultures titled Aid Agency as we discuss Phil's experience in Europe after February 24th, 2022. My name is Kia Middleton and you're listening to Crossing Cultures.